Okay, welcome back to the Money Pit. I'm here with Jacob Carver from the Butcher Shop and B. Brian something or other from Midnight's yeah, nice Gaming Emporium. Today we're going to talk about, oh, by the way, it's Mike Money from the Money Pit. I, I probably said that Mike already. Buddy. Mike Monty. Monty? Monty. Monty. The full Monty. The full Monty? We're going to talk about Mid-South Wrestling slash UWF. And for those of you who don't like wrestling, this might be one of the last wrestling for a while, so it should make you happy. But for the rest of you, you suck it. Anyway, Bill Watts bought Tri-State Wrestling and renamed it Mid-South Wrestling in 1979. He withdrew from the NWA, but would still have the NWA Worlds. Got to put the S on. Champion defend the title on his shows, which was unheard of. I mean, if you're not affiliated, you shouldn't. Anyway, instead of cartoonish characters and interviews, Watts focused on energetic matches and characters whose personas blurred the lines between good and evil. Almost an early ECW to a certain degree. Just a little bit. Maybe the Attitude Era? Yeah. Before the Attitude Era was popular? But UWF definitely pushed the envelope when it came yeah. to... Once we get to that. Mid-South, not as much, but when we get to UWF, definitely pushed them. Yeah. Like we were talking, every, every time you watch it for an hour, Somebody bled every week, but we'll get to that. In 1980, a card pitting a blinded JYD, oh my God, against Freebird Michael Hayes in the main event drew nearly 30,000 fans. Not bad for a promotion less than a year old, right? In 1984, Watts came out of retirement to team with Stagger Lee, which was JYD in a mask, to face the Midnight Express to cap an angle in which the Express and Cornette would beat Watts on TV. This also featured the showdown between Magnum T.A. and his mentor, Mr. Wrestling 2. Overrated. Oh, did I say that? The guy was like a midget. Daniel Bryan. I think it was Daniel Bryan's dad. I'm just saying. Daniel Bryan doesn't do the bionic knee lift, but maybe he should. But anyway, I just never thought much of Mr. Wrestling 2. Right. But this drew 22,000 fans. Again, this is a little-known federation. Pretty intense. In the mid to late 80s, Mid-South began to expand nationally. Ted Turner invited Watts to air a show on TBS as an alternate... <laughs> alternative. Thank you. That's easy for you to say. An alternative to the WWF. This is only my fourth beer, so I don't know why I'm stumbling over my tongue. It quickly became the highest rated program on TBS. Watts positioned himself to take over the two-hour Saturday block. Occupied... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Can you read for me? Occupied. Occupied. <laughs> Occupied by the WWF, but his luck ran out when former Georgia promoter Jim Barnett, piece of shit, helped broker a deal that allowed NWA promoter Jim Crockett Jr. to buy the time slot from McMahon, which forced the elimination of Mid-South Wrestling on TBS. Watts made one more attempt to go national the following year, when Mid-South would become the Universal Wrestling Federation, or UWF. All hell's breaking loose in the <laughs> UWF! In 1986, way to go, JR. A lot of former WCCW stars came over, but they could not compete against Crockett and McMahon, partially because the oil based Oklahoma economy went in a severe recession. In 1987, Watts sold the UWF to Crockett after losing $50,000 a week out of his own pocket, according to him. This is when they tried to unify the UWF title, it would have been Dr. Death Steve Williams, overrated, oh wait a minute, we already did that, uh, against Flair, and suppose we had one match for 30 minutes and Flair said, I ain't wrestling him again, because to say Dr. Death was stiff is like, probably a little, what else could you say? No. Understatement? Yeah, Understatement. what was the, the comment that guy made that time about, as stiff as a hard on, for, I can't remember, he was talking about a porn star, it was, Again, it would be... Stiff as a John Holmes hard on? Something, but it wasn't John Holmes. Anyway. We'll go with that. Okay. I already... Uh-oh. Mike Money's screwing up. Boo! Okay, we're, we're going to take an intermission. Ta -ta -na -ta -ta -ta. Bill Watts was an outstanding promoter who ran into bad luck on more than one occasion. As a commentator, he sucked ass, but as a promoter, he was great. He always said he wrestled for all the main guys, and he took everything he liked from him and threw out everything he didn't. And my guess, I've never heard of a wrestler bitch about him that wrestled for him. So I think he was probably a really good guy. Uh, Junkyard Dog was the biggest star in Mid-South. And one feud that comes to mind was Butch Reed. Reed actually painted him yellow and tarred and feathered him in the next show. And it would culminate in a ghetto street fight, which was the worst ending I've ever seen in a match. 
but we won't even go there. Butch Reed, one, two, three. The winner, Junkyard Dog. What? Anyway, one of the early stars was Ted DiBiase and his loaded glove. He formed the Rat Pack with Frank Sinatra. Wait a minute, no, that's a different okay, Rat Pack. Wrong Rat Pack. Dean Martin, Sammy Davis. Yeah. yeah. He formed a Rat Pack with Matt Bourne and Jim Duggan. While they were very successful, Bourne and Duggan did not get along, but they had this stupid thing where Duggan came out dressed like a gorilla. And the only reason I mention it, because if you buy that Mid-South compilation, you're going to see it and you're going to shake your head. And he's there throw, eating bananas and it's just so fucking stupid. Mid-South was not above doing stupid shit. I mean, every every federation no, that did probably it. still wasn't worse as the Canadian Jim Duggan. Gimmick. No, Canadian Jim Duggan was worse. That was probably worse. I, I like Duggan as a heel. I like that part because people forget that. It's like, oh, no, you got to remember that. Like Mr. USA Canadian. But after turning Duggan face, his feud with DiBiase culminated in the classic coal miner's glove, steel cage, tuxedo, Loser Leaves Town match. They forgot the barbed wire, right? Yeah. Wow. I just... Could you have any more gimmicks in the match? And the I, They forgot the Dildo on a pole match. Dildo on a pole match? Wait, that's HWE. Yeah. I am all fucked up here. Fucking nights are off. Later in 1985, DiBiase was a heel. He would be set to face Ric Flair. Woo! For the NWA World's title. World's. But would get posted by Dick Murdoch. Dirty Dick? Dirty, Dirty Dick yeah. Murdoch. Before the match and bleeds profusely from the forehead. He gets bandaged up in the back and comes out and puts on a good match and becomes a face. Sort of sounds like Parker Bradley. Who? Does anybody remember that bum? Yeah, exactly. Mike Money? Yeah. No, Mike, Mike Money was all right. Mike, Mike Parker Bradley awesome. was a bum. Mike Money's off He's a bum. He's uh, a bum. <laughs> Jim Ross got his start doing commentary. What did he say? Oh, hell. Oh, hell's breaking loose in the UWF. Okay, some other highlights. Kamala. Wait. Go ahead and give me the, get, I'll let you give me the Do job. I gotta do that? Yeah, give me the chop. Oh! He actually body slammed Andre the Giant. I know no one's supposed to believe he did it. I watched it. A huge feud between the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express would start here. I thought for years it was started in the NWA. So this was interesting. They had some really good matches. They shaved Cornette's head, and I, they didn't show that. But he'd come out wearing a mask. He looked like Mr. Wrestling, which was kind of funny. Because I'm like, who is this bum with a mask on? No maskers. Yes. No maskers. Okay, Shawn Michaels was a jobber here. How you like that? No one was remembers he, was it. Was he under the moniker, Shawn Michaels? Yes. He was, and he he talks about, he had this one match with DiBiase where they actually let him do three things, and he realized, hey, I can do a cute couple things and still make the match look good. Because it looked like three times he actually was going to get the pin. Well, you never saw that. Jobbers usually got beat from beginning to end. Rusty Brooks, it's over. Okay, the TV title here was a metal worn around your neck. What the fuck is that? <laughs> And in 1985, Dick Slater threw it in the Arkansas River. Dirty Dick, another Dirty Dick. Dirty Love dick. that. How many Dirty Dicks were there? Right? There were, I don't... Quite a few. Ask, <laughs> ask Missy Hyatt. Ask Missy Hyatt, yeah. <laughs> Missy Hyatt had a lot of Dirty Dicks in her time. Or Pat Patterson. Yes, oh, this is true. true that this man. brings me to the Sandman, the Sandman, the Snowman. Listen to me. After JYD left, Bill Watts, and this was another thing where he fucked up. And again, not every good promoter does everything right, but... He spent so much time trying to get this black hero. Because JYD, you know, he brought all the black people loved him. So they tried to replace him with Brickhouse Brown. Do you remember? I know you remember him. Yeah. Savannah Jack? Yeah. So they got this snowman guy. It was he was muscular, but he had no fucking skills. He couldn't talk to Mike. The only thing this is known for was he was TV champion. He defended the belt against the biggest heel in that country, in the country, in that company at the time, Jake the Snake Roberts. He also had uh, Nord the Barbarian was in his corner because that's why they brought in Muhammad Ali to try to fight the outset Nord the Barbarian. Muhammad Ali was just punch drunk and he didn't know what he was doing all the time. So that's the only reason people remember that. I don't know why I brought it up, but I like throwing the title in the river, so I brought that up. Okay, one of the strangest things is bad enough if they throw you over the top rope, it's a DQ. If you go off the top rope, it's a DQ. Really? You, Macho Man would not have made a career here. That's just horrible. He'd be rolling around in his grave, wouldn't he? Oh, that's right. Nah, don't be talking about him. That's my boy. <laughs> Some other stars there were Gentleman Chris Adams, Dr. Death Steve Williams, 
No? Okay. One one man gang. Don't you have a story about him? One yeah, one man gang and a uh, hacksaw Jim Duggan had a uh, feud going. And uh I think it was during some form of a tournament. Do you know tournament? Yes. Yes. They That's had an altercation me. outside of the ring where you know, the whole thing where they get thrown into the ring post and they put their hand up. Well, I guess Duggan didn't get his hand up on time. <laughs> and his Oops. head legitimately went into the bolt that sticks out of the ring that holds the turnbuckle in place <laughs> and put one hell of a gash in his forehead. And since this was UWF, they showed this. And then they like put like a close up of it where you could see this huge mm -hmm. freaking hole in his freaking head. Yeah. It was like my God. Like, one of and these... then he he took to the back, and it was the funniest thing ever because he came out all bandaged, all bandaged. Yeah, now I have your yeah, problem. There you go. You can make fun of me. Uh, just like yeah, they would do head? for uh, the the fake head injuries right. for other ones, but it, but this was like legitimate, and they just had to laugh at it. Well, Oh my God! They actually do bandage people up like that. And speaking of Axel Duggan, another thing I noticed in watching some of these old matches, he was as bad as Dusty. If you looked at his forehead, were all the times he yes. cut his head. Oh my mm -hmm. God! My buddy used to, Jim Lomenzi used to say he could plant corn in his forehead. Axel yeah. fits that. Yep. Okay. Uh, Big Bubba Rogers was there too. Actually, one of the weird things he beat One Man Gang for the world title. They became the Twin Towers in the WWE. It was still WWF at the time. It was because Big Bubba Rogers became the Big Boss Man, Big boss and One Man Gang became One Man Gang. Oh, okay. <laughs> but he also became a Keem later, which was horrible. The, the, the dream. African Dream. Yeah, that, that was, was horrible. horrible. That was a horrible. Okay. Also, we had the Freebirds, and one thing I liked about this, they really pushed Terry Gordy because he was so underrated and probably one of the nicest guys ever in the business. He was their champion for the longest time. I I, I absolutely adored uh, Bam Bam. Right? Bam, Bam, Terry Gordy. Bam Bam Gordy? Okay. R.I.P. Yes. And they also had upcoming stars like Rob Rex Steiner. Anybody? Rick Steiner. Rick Steiner. Why wasn't Scott Steiner there? No, he came in later. And he was, uh, he was younger, that's why. Was and, and the Blade Runners, who were, what were their names then? Not now. Rock and, Rock and Sting. Sting. And obviously Sting stayed Sting and Rock became... Dingo Warrior. Dingo Warrior. Yes, and when... came the ultimate... Let down. Maybe the dingo ate your warrior. Thank you, Come Elaine. From space in the cookie room. No, that's <laughs> Kevin Solomon. So when Dingo yeah, he left for up yeah. too as well. No, he he was like, My warriors <laughs> That was what he did. Now you and then we off. blast off in outer space or shit yeah, like that. It was horrible. Because I think he got into Jacob. Anyway, we, we talked in way too much about this bum. <laughs> He's this is the one dead guy I love saying what a fucking bum he was. Don't speak ill of the dead. Fuck him. He was a piece of shit when he's alive. He's a piece of shit when he's dead. I don't fucking care. Let the worms eat him. I don't fucking care. When he left for WCW, though, Eddie Gilbert, who was the manager, put Sting with Rick Steiner, and they became a formidable tag team. I'm pretty sure they were tag team champions for a little while, and I think then they turned on Sting to make him the face that he was. Gilbert feuded with Hollywood John Tatum over Missy Hyde, who had dirty dicks left and right, and center and you know, well didn't Gilbert and Hollywood <coughs> John Tatum become a tag team? Well what? they were it was Hollywood Hot Stuff it was Hyatt and Hot Hyatt Hot Stuff International or Hot Stuff Hyatt International. But like I said, John he Tatum. decided he wanted to fuck her more than so he ended up with her anyway. We also had the first ever barbed wire steel cage match to be shown on TV, featuring the Sheep Herders and Jack Victory versus the Fantastics and Terry Taylor. Any memories here? That was at that point when I was a young butcher, that was the bloodiest fucking match I ever saw. In and they showed it on TV. And they showed yeah. it on TV. And to this day, I think it still rivals any of the garbage shit that I've ever seen, like fucking Combat Zone and FMW. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was awesome. And UW, day. UWF was definitely the groundbreaker, probably leading into all the garbage fed stuff. Yeah. And uh, the uh, one sheep herder. What do you think it was Butch? But, but, yeah, maybe or, Butch. One, Butch of look, one of them. They, I guess, cut his tongue open on the barbed wire because you know Ooh. they, they, they had to be they their little gimmick. Even when they went to the WWF, then was always like biting shit and having their tongue out. Yeah. And I guess 
they got a little bit and carried away. Yeah, tongue out after a long time. You got to cut it up the barbed wire. Bar bar. Okay, which brings me to Terry Taylor. This is, I love telling this story, and I, I wish we could actually show him saying it, but I don't want sued by the one person that actually owns Mid-South. Anyway, he was set to wrestle Ric Flair for the NWA World's title at the Louisiana Superdome. I think this was 1985. And this is in Taylor's words. I'm not so... Pretend I'm the Red Rooster. Okay. He's supposed to show up... Taylor's words. He's supposed to show up at 6 o'clock, but he's nervous he gets there at 2 o'clock. Flair's late as usual. 7 o'clock. He's not here. 7.30. Still not here. Why do I... I'm saying the time I'm looking at my watch. 8 o'clock. The show starts. He's still not here. 8.15, Flair shows up, reeking of alcohol. Yeah, this is probably the greatest. Surprise. Looking like he's been wearing the same clothes for three days. His hair is matted. He stinks. He's being helped in by security. Rick lays down on the couch and says, come get me in an hour. I'm hot. I'm steaming. How are you going to make me a bigger star when you're hungover? The best part was, he says to me, bring me a cup of coffee in an hour. I do what I'm told. Now here we are, 20 minutes from the match. He's still a mess. I end up going to my locker room. I'm seething. I'm so pissed off. What the fuck? I'm thinking, I have to carry Flair to a 12-minute match, and at this time, I don't think I can do it. So his music hits. He comes out looking like a champion. His hair is done. The robe looks great. I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll see what happens. 40 minutes later, I'm begging him to pin me because I can't breathe. And he's going, let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on, rookie. Let's do it. Finally, at the 48-minute mark, he pins me, and I was never so happy to lose a match in my life. One hour before the match, he couldn't even open his eyes. And I said, this guy's not from planet Earth. Later on that night on Bourbon Street, he's out having a good time. Him, not me. I was in an iron lung trying to get my breath back. Ric Flair was amazing. I have not embellished or made up any of this story. Woo! Love that. Not a big Terry Taylor fan, but that is an awesome fucking story. Yep. Any other statements, words? That, just the, that Terry Taylor story is one of the best ever in wrestling. It no really doubt. is. And people don't realize what a great guy Flair was when you hear shit like that. And he would do this every night. He'd close yep. the bar till 4 in the morning, get up at 6. He's, it's like, you're fucking insane. How could you do that? Mm -hmm. He's going to outlive us, I guarantee it. Yep. He's going to be 135 years old when we're dead. <laughs> I have no doubt in my body. Anyway, this was Jacob Carver. What's your show? And B. Brian, what's his face? Yeah, from Midnight's <laughs> Gaming Emporium. And Mike Money saying, fuck off. Cha-ching. Mail Chris.